Okay, I'm going to try and fit all of particle and quantum physics onto one A4 piece of paper. Don't forget that you can download the PDF links in description. So let's first look at the types of particles that we have, that is things that make up matter. We split particles into two main groups, hadrons and leptons. Leptons are fundamental particles, examples are electron, positron and neutrinos. However, we can split hadrons in two again, into baryons and mesons. Baryons and mesons are made of quarks, and quarks are fundamental particles, as far as we know. Baryons have three quarks, and mesons have two quarks, always a quark and an antiquark. And the quarks are held together by the strong nuclear force. Examples are the neutron and proton, and the main meson we deal with is the pion, but there are others. Conservation rules, we know that baryons have a baryon number and leptons have a lepton number. So let's talk about the four forces that we're concerned with in physics, specifically in the area of quantum electrodynamics. The electromagnetic force, the gauge boson or the exchange particle for that is the virtual photon. Strong nuclear force, the gauge boson is the pion, sometimes you'll see the gluon. Weak is W plus or W minus. We don't really deal with the Z zero. And the cousin that we all ignore is gravity because we don't really understand it as well. And even though we haven't found it, we call the exchange particle the graviton. Okay, let's talk about the strong nuclear force. It keeps a nucleus together. Of course, the electrostatic repulsion of the protons in the nucleus means that the EM force is always trying to explode a nucleus. So that means that we must have another force keeping it together, and that's the strong nuclear force. And that affects neutrons and protons. What's stopping the strong nuclear force from imploding a nucleus then? Well, what we say is when the nucleons get too close together to 0.5 femtometers, the strong nuclear force flips from being attractive to repulsive. And the range of attraction for the strong nuclear force is about three to four femtometers. Okay, so we know that mass and energy are interchangeable. The equation that links the two is the equation for rest energy of a particle, and that's E equals mc squared. Mass is converted into energy in annihilation. That's when a particle and its corresponding antiparticle collide and they're destroyed, and the rest energy is converted into photons. So we can say that E equals mc squared plus half mv squared, that's the kinetic energy of the particles going in, and we have two lots of HF coming out. The opposite is pair production, that's when a photon turns into two particles. Again, a particle and its corresponding antiparticle. Of course, the photon must have at least the same amount of energy as the rest energy of the particles. So again, E equals mc squared, but if the photon has more than the minimum amount of energy, then the leftover energy is turned into kinetic energy of the particles afterwards. Okay, let's talk about ionizing radiation, alpha, beta, gamma. I call them ionizing radiation because all of these can give electrons enough energy to escape an atom or molecule, therefore ionizing them. An alpha particle is a helium nucleus, two protons and two neutrons. It's highly ionizing, mostly because it's very heavy, but it's weakly penetrating. It's stopped by a piece of paper or a few centimeters of air. Beta particle is a fast moving electron. Don't worry, I'll fix my mistake in a second. And it has medium ionizing and penetrating ability stopped by a few millimeters of aluminium. Gamma is just a high energy EM ray or photon, and that's emitted from an energetic nucleus. Photons don't have charge, so they can't change the nucleus in any way when they're emitted. It's weakly ionizing, but it's highly penetrative. It can't be stopped really, but the intensity can be reduced by concrete and lead. Okay, here are the decay equations for alpha and beta. We know that alpha is four and two, beta is zero and minus one, because it's got the opposite charge to a proton. And so therefore it's just mass then, isn't it? Don't forget that for beta decay, we must have an anti-electron neutrino produced as well to make sure that lepton number is conserved. Here's a Feynman diagram for beta minus decay. We have a neutron turning into a proton and the W minus boson takes the negative charge away as it were to produce an electron and an anti-electron neutrino. A neutron is up, down, down, proton is up, up, down, so therefore we can say that actually it's a down quark turning into an up quark. You can see either one on a Feynman diagram for this. Okay, conservation rules, what has to be conserved? Charge, lepton number, and baryon number, Q, L, and B. They're always conserved. Strangeness, however, is only conserved in strong interactions. Incidentally, any interaction that involves leptons has to be a weak interaction. It's good to be reminded about what a muon is. It's effectively a heavy electron. And a reminder that lepton number-wise, electrons and neutrinos have a lepton number of plus one because the electron is the OG lepton, as it were. Positron has a lepton number of minus one. Okay, let's go back a little bit. Isotopes, what are they? Well, they're the same element. That means the same number of protons or same atomic number. 
but with a different number of neutrons, so that means they have a different relative atomic mass, like carbon-12 and carbon-14 here. Specific charge is the charge to mass ratio, so we calculate it by doing charge divided by mass. So the unit is coulombs per kilogram, generally a very big number because the masses of these particles are tiny. Worth remembering that one electron volt is the same number as the charge of an electron because one electron volt is the energy in joules that an electron has when accelerated through a PD of one volt. So that means that one electron volt is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Quite often we deal with mega electron volts and so if we have to convert that into joules it's 1.6 times 10 to the minus 13. Yes, you can figure that out, but it's useful as a shortcut. Okay, so let's go on to some quantum then. What is the photoelectric effect? It's when photons of sufficient energy are absorbed by electrons on the surface of a metal, therefore liberating them. They escape. The equation is Ek max is equal to Hf minus phi. Hf being the energy of the photon that goes in, phi being the work function, that's the minimum energy needed to liberate electrons. And so taking one away from the other gives you the kinetic energy left when an electron has escaped. Here's the graph, the y-intercept is minus phi. The x-intercept is the threshold frequency. That's the minimum frequency needed for electrons to be liberated. If the frequency is less than that, you won't see any electrons liberated. And in that case, ek max is equal to zero, so hf zero equals phi. Okay, so what did the photoelectric effect prove? Well, it proved that light has a particle nature, not just wave nature due to the one-to-one -one interactions between photons and electrons. And it's one-to-one -one because if it were only a wave, then increasing the intensity of light would have increased the EK of the electrons liberated. But it doesn't. All it does is increase the number of electrons that are emitted per second because there are more photons. Okay, so here's a circuit that we can use to measure the kinetic energy of these electrons. We have a variable PD applied across these two plates. We shine light on one of them, specifically the anode, and that will make electrons cross the gap, and then they will flow around the circuit, producing a current. What we do is increase the PD in the opposite direction, as it were, until the current goes to zero. That means that the electrons are no longer crossing the gap, so we know that their kinetic energy has been counteracted, as it were, by the energy supplied by the battery. We call this PD the stopping potential, and we know that any voltage is energy divided by charge, and it's the same here. So we can say that Ek max is equal to E, charge of an electron, times the stopping potential for Vs. A de Broglie wavelength is the wavelength that a particle can have. And the wave nature of particles was proven with electrons being fired at a graphite film, and we see circular fringes on a phosphorescent screen behind. And that's because the electrons are diffracting around the carbon atoms and producing maxima and minima on the screen, just like light. Here's the pattern for it. Note that the intensity doesn't really go to zero. De Broglie wavelength is equal to Planck's constant over momentum, or h over p, or h over mv. Quite often we'll be given the energy of electrons, but we'll have to find out the momentum in order to put it into the equation. So we find that by doing e equals half mv squared, times the whole thing by m, and that gives you me equals half p squared. Rearranging, we get momentum p equals root two m times the energy. Okay, fluorescent tube, what we have is a tube with a cathode on one end and an anode on the other end. The cathode is heated with a current. Electrons are emitted by thermionic emission. They're attracted to the anode on the other side and they bash into low pressure mercury gas atoms on the way raising their electrons to higher energy levels. We'll talk about energy levels in a bit. As these electrons de-excite, they emit UV photons, not visible light, and then these UV photons are absorbed by the electrons in the coating, and then when these de-excite, they emit visible light. And then finally, energy levels running out of space here, so I apologize for the crampness of this bit. Electrons can be promoted or excited to higher energy levels, through two ways, either they can absorb a photon of energy exactly equal to the difference in energy levels, or a free electron can come along and collide with it and impart some of its energy to the electron, making it go up to a higher energy level. We have the ionization level. If enough energy is given to an electron, then it will escape an atom or molecule completely. We have absorption and emission spectra. Emission spectrum we can get from the sun because light is just being emitted from it or any other light. Absorption spectrum is when we have a gas and shine all wavelengths through it and see what's transmitted, what's absorbed. And then we can tell what kind of elements are present. 
If you want to test your knowledge on this stuff, then go have a look at my flashcard videos on particles and quantum physics. See you there.